So I will uh, begin on my end. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another PMD Live. My name is Bashan. I am part of the event staff of Politics and Prose. Uh, before we begin this event, I just have a couple quick items to go over. The first is that if at any time you'd like to ask a question of our featured author, we would ask for you to place it below in the Q&A box, which you can find towards the bottom of your screen. Um, that'll just help us to keep everything organized and help to facilitate the question and answer period. Additionally, um, at any time during this event, you'll be, go be able to go to the chat section where you'll be able to find a link which will take you directly to the Politics and Prose website where you can purchase a copy of They Better Call Me Sugar. Um, we, of course, highly encourage you to do so and thank you for your continued patronage. Growing up in dire poverty, Sugar Rogers never imagined that she would become an all-star player in the WNBA. Both of her siblings were in and out of prison throughout much of her childhood and shootings in her neighborhood were commonplace. For Sugar, this was just a fact of life. With the love and support of her family and friends, Sugar's performance on her high school basketball team led to her recruitment by the Georgetown Hoyas and her eventual draft into the WNBA in 2013 by the Minnesota Lynx, who won the NBA, WNBA Finals in Sugar's first year. The first of her family to attend college, Sugar speaks of her struggles both academically and as an athlete with raw honesty. Sugar's road to a successful career as a professional basketball player is fraught with sadness and death, including her mother's death when she was only 14, which leaves Sugar essentially homeless. Throughout it all, Sugar clings to basketball as a way to keep herself focused and sane. Sugar will be in conversation today with Etan Thomas, a former NBA player himself who played for the Washington Wizards, Oklahoma, Oklahoma City Thunder, and Atlanta Hawks. He is a senior writer for basketballnews.com and is the host of The Rematch. Without any further ado, the floor is yours. All right, all right, good little introduction. How you doing, Sugar? I'm doing good, how you doing, Ethan? I am great. Listen, I want to tell you, first of all, that I enjoyed this book. This is the book, I got it right here. It's a fantastic and inspiring book. Um, and we're gonna delve into all of this. Before we start, I want to, this is <coughs> daughter's right here. I want her to listen to this because I thought <laughs> that your book is so inspiring and she's Thank gonna you. be reading it soon, but I wanted her to listen to our entire discussion. So this, that's Imani, <laughs> years old. And so I, there's so much I want to, um, we're going to delve into. Um, so let's go back. Let's start, let's start back. We heard the introduction and, you know, we know you, you know, got the, won the WNBA title in 2013, your rookie year, the uh, WNBA All-Star 2017. You got the uh, uh, sixth woman of the year in 2017. We know all those accolades. Uh, so you got your Georgetown shirt. We'll get to all of that. We broke records and set records and three points. <laughs> champion and everything, but let's, let's, let's go all the way back because your story started far before that. Yes. And um, I want to go back to middle school. You, you, you talked, you touched on it on your, in your book. Um, and in middle school, that's when a lot of things changed and you had to grow up really quickly. Uh, you had to take on responsibility that most middle schoolers don't have to take on. So let's start, let's start there. And let's talk about what was going on with you in middle school. So, I mean, in middle school, I rarely went to school because I became my mom's nurse. So it's a saying like, this in the African-American community, what goes on in this house stays in this house. And that's kind of what we live by. So when my mom started to get sick, um, my brothers and everybody was young. So my brother was like 17 or 18. And then I was like 13. 13, 12, 13 years old. And, um, you know, we had a, a supported family. So we always was like, I'm gonna take care of my mom, my niece worked and my brother and my two nephews, they hustled and my sister was in prison. So being my mom's nurse 24 seven, that mean I had to change her, I had to take care of her. Um, I just had to make sure that she was gonna be straight. And um, that's, that's pretty much when all of this started. And you're, you're, when you talk about, you said your, 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 um, your cousins hustled, um, mm -hmm. and you had a lot 
going on around you. Um, your home was once taken in a drug bus. Like yeah. talk to us, like paint the, the, the full picture of where you came from, because it's like the, you know, the rose that grew out of the concrete. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that, that Pac, well, Pac didn't start it, my Angelou started it. But that, that, that entire notion where your surroundings didn't determine who you were and they didn't limit you you busted through all of your surroundings. And that's why it's such an inspirational story. So let, let's go back a little bit, um, you know, to this to this part where your home was taken in a drug bus. Tell, tell me about that. So like I said, like my mom had been sick and my brother and my, my sister was in prison, but my brother and my nephews, cause my sister had kids. She had three kids, um, two sons and a daughter who my mom was taking care of at the time while she was in prison. And, um, you know, we stayed in like a beat down house and in the hood. And uh, once my mom got sick, we could no longer take care of the house. So it was all these leaks, holes everywhere, um, you know, light, just just a bunch of problems. And uh, that's kind of why my brother and them hustled so that they could take care of the family. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember like being outside this one day, I'm just sitting on the porch and my nephews and everybody is out there and they just hustling because I we call the kind of, it's like sort of a trap house, like where they do all the drug exchanges, the drug deals. And um, these these guys, they was like walking in the neighborhood, but you know, like suspicious people, cause you kind of grew up, you grew up there. And um, I remember sitting on the porch and then all these people just started rushing the house and they just put my nephew in handcuffs. And I was just sitting there on the porch, like, man, like what is going on? Although I kind of knew what was going on, I was just, mm -hmm. I was in this state of shock. And then once that happened, they took everybody to jail, whoever had drugs on them or whatnot. And I just kind of like sat on the porch and they was like, is anybody else in the house? I'm like, yeah, my mom is in there. So once they went in, they was like, you know, this house is not in livable condition. So the city came out and they condemned the house. So oh, wow. they condemned the house with everything in it. So we couldn't go in and get nothing. We just could get stuff out for that night. And, um, you know, my brother and them end up couldn't get it. They couldn't get it fixed. So eventually, it was demolished with all of our belongings in it. Wow, wow. And and how how do you bounce back from that? Like that's a lot to deal okay. with. And and one of the things, and I'm I'm going over a lot of the details of it that you detail in the book. Um, and I think it's so inspirational for young people today because. You know, they see you and we'll get to that NBA and WNBA championships and, you know, setting the titles and, and Georgetown, everything like that. But they don't know the, the roads that people had to go through in order to get to that point. You know, so you telling this story and, and everything that you're explaining in this book, it's so inspirational. Like, I, I, I can't say it enough. You know, it, it's, it's amazing for you to rise from all of this. Um, so how, how did you, in chapter six, you talk about your first jail visit. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me about that a little bit. So my mom was like, my sister had been in prison for a long, for a long time. And this, at this point she was in jail because she was in jail. And then they send you to prison once you mm -hmm. get your time or whatnot. And I remember, I'm just like, I want to go, like, I want to go visit my sister. I haven't seen her and my niece and my mom, they went all the time, um, uh, I'm pretty sure they went on a Wednesday night to go visit her. And I was like, I just want to go. And I knew the jail was across the street from my elementary school. So I was like, all right, cool. My mom was like, all right, come on, you can go. And I was like, oh, I get to go see my sister. I'm excited. I'm so excited. I'm like, I get to see her. And then we get to the jail and it's just like, this is what we about to get into. So we go in, we sign in and I'm just looking like, okay, I can't wait to see my sister. I can't wait. Cause I'm thinking, I've seen on TV where I'm like, the people can touch the people, but in this jail, you can't. Like you're literally looking through a glass. Mm. So we wait and they call a name. So I'm like, all right, I'm getting antsy. I'm about to see my sister. I ain't seen her in a while. I just wonder what she looked like, you know, what she got on. Mm. And I get in there and we see her. She's smiling through the glass. Like she's so excited to see us. And I just see like all these women, I'm just looking around like all these women, like what did they do? Like you know, they tell us like bad people go to jail. Right. But I'm thinking my sister not bad. Like, you know, I've never seen her do any bad things. And uh, we get to the, we get to our seat, and she like gets on the phone. She's talking to my mom, and then she gets to talk to me. But I'm still just 
kind of amazed. Like these women are really locked up in here like animals. Like they can't go home. Mm. And um, you know, we got to see her. We really we couldn't touch her because obviously you're looking through the glass, but um I got to communicate with her and put my eyes on her. And this is all in middle school, right? This is all in middle school. It's all, all in middle school. I just want to keep repeating <laughs> that fact because so people know how old you are when all of this is going on. Now, in um, in chapter eight, you talked about going toe to toe with a drug dealer. Talk to me about that. I mean, I just betted money. Like I've always betted on myself, and my mom gave me money to play. Like I would run in the house, like, "Mom, can I get a few dollars, five dollars?" She like get the money out of my purse, but don't come back in here and ask for no more money when you lose or if you lose. And um, every day my goal just attracted so much attention. Everybody used to hang out there. We used to just take over the street um, and they used to bet money. Like they would bet on the little kids. Like when we played three on three, like if y'all won, they would give us a few dollars so that we could go to the candy lady or whatnot. Mm. And this day, uh, I was called out. You know, that's my goal. I go out there every day. Like, mm. I can shoot on my own goal. And this guy, his name Sam, he was one of the, you know, bigger drug dealers in our, in our community. And um, we was just out there shooting. And then all of a sudden, it's just like all these people around. And I'm just going shot for shot. We just betting my money. I'm betting my little $5, but I come up and I'm like, all right, cool. Like I'm winning, I'm cushioning, I'm splashing the shot from here. Right. And, um, he just talking trash. He talking mad trash. And you know, you know, men got those egos. And I'm a, uh, at this time, I'm a, I'm, I'm a little girl at this uh, time. And I'm winning. And then everybody on the sidelines just betting sad money. So he just called my brother out. My brother just dropped all this money on me. And I'm like, man, my heart is beat. I'm like, the pressure is on. I got to make this shot. And um, I hit the shot. I got about $25, $30. Mm-hmm. And my friends, I see some of them cheering against me. So I'm kind of like sad. <laughs> then we all, go to the, we all go to the corner store. And I'm like, hold up. Like, I ain't buying people nothing if they won't cheer for me. Right. And, then, um, you know, that's kind of how that kind of how that went every day. That's stuff that we did in our neighborhood, just bet money on that basketball goal, the football field, marbles, anything you can imagine, like we bet. Now, in a book, you talked about how the, how basketball was kind of an outlet for you. And when you're going through all of this different stuff, um, you know, you, you, it was like an escape. Talk about that part and how did it become a stake? How did you fall in love with basketball to have it be that escape for you? So prior to like, I played golf and that was kind of something I did with my mom and she never really wanted me to play basketball. She always pushed me into being on the LPGA. Right. You talked about um, that with Tiger Woods. Like Tiger Woods. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I ended up just playing. Like once my brother bought me that goal, I used to always just go outside and play on it. And I fell in love with it. And Mm -hmm. um, when everything was going on, that's where I went because I couldn't go too far because I had to take care of my mom. So I could go right in front and just shoot around and, and you know, do other things. But um, it became my safe haven. When I was out there, it just felt like I was just out there in another whole world. And, um, you know, people discovered me and like my talents from playing in the neighborhood. And I went to play on the church team because my mama, she was like, okay, you can go play for the church people, but you can't go play for these other people that don't have no idea who they are, you know, right. I just send my little girl anywhere. Right. And, um, you know, eventually basketball just saved my life. Wow. Now you talked about the, when your mother got sick mm-hmm. and how that changed a lot for you. Um, walk us through that, what happened when your mother got sick and you had to take care of her and you was basically, um, what do you call it? Like an au pair, like where you, you're, you're taking care of your mother and doing all the medical stuff, like everything mm-hmm. at yeah. like eighth, eighth grade. Talk to me about that and how you even knew what to do. So my mom always just prepared me. She said, I'm not going to always be here, but that's because she knew she was sick, but nobody was telling me that she was sick. Like they knew, but I didn't know. I just knew that she was getting weaker. She didn't want to go to the golf practice with me and, um, I just remember like all of a sudden it was just like this lady laying here and I just didn't know who she was. 
I mean, she couldn't walk, talk, so I had to like bathe her, um, you know, wash her up, pick her up, put her over here, clean up the sheets, clean up the house, making sure that she ate, uh, you know, one of her favorite things to eat at this point. You know, I just used to go to McDonald's and get her fish combo, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so I didn't know what I was doing. I was just doing what I could do. And the best thing, like the, what was best for my mom at the time was me taking care of her. Um, Cause everybody else was doing their own thing. Like my niece, she would work, she worked at McDonald's and she had a son who I also took care of at that time. So I was the babysitter for her, but I was also the nurse for my mom. Was, was giving up ever a thought for you, especially after chapter 13 with the funeral? Was giving uh, up on just life as a whole ever a thought for you? It was, but then it was like, I've been through all of this, like I'm getting through. So, you know, I gotta keep pushing. I gotta keep going. Like, especially when my mom died, it became motivation for me. Mm. I didn't have no choice but to make it. It was no other way. Like I couldn't give up. I, I just couldn't. That's not wow. what she taught us. She always taught us to keep fighting, keep striving. Time's gonna get hard, but you know, it's a way out. But but after after your mother passed, you was you was homeless for a while and you was living kind of from wherever you could find somebody. You talked about um, your coach, Betty. You stayed mm -hmm. with Betty for a while. You stayed with Aunt Linda for a while. Mm -hmm. you with friends. So it was just like whoever you could kind of, you know, lay your head down with for a little while. Um, and you was essentially homeless. Now, how long did that go on? That went on, I mean, so I went to college. Mm. that's kind of how that was happening. Like, I, like you said, like I would stay with Coach Betty. I would stay with um, my cousin Keita. I would stay with my Aunt Linda. And um, it became kind of permanent when I went to my cousin Keita's house. That's where, you know, things started to change for me. Uh, just And then when I went to college, just having kind of like my own space um, for change was kind of different. So talk about the um, the recruiting process. So once you started getting recruited, um, how did that feel? And what was that process like for you? It felt good. I really didn't know. Like, I just wanted, to be honest, coming out of high school, I'm like, I'm going to the military on a buddy system with my best friend. But I ended up being very good at basketball. And then my best friend, her name, I, Shishi or Rashida, um, she got a scholarship. So I was like, okay, like, now we get all friends. We're like, oh, are we going to go to college? So she went. And that motivated me to like, you know, want to go to college and further my education. So I ended up playing on Boo Williams, uh, Nike elite team. And mm -hmm. um, I remember like not starting or nothing. I'm like, this is different. Because in high school, I was the go-to player. I was the star player. Right. And then I just worked my way up through the summer. And I was eventually starting. All of these teams were coming out like, offer me scholarships to Georgetown, Virginia Tech, I mean, anywhere you can name. And I kept saying, like, if I go to Georgetown, because Georgetown offered me my, like, temporary year, like, if I go to Georgetown, this is going to change my life academically. I wasn't worried about the basketball side. That's just something that I did, and I was just naturally talented at it. I was like, going to Georgetown is going to save my life. And um, I didn't go on, the, you know, you get, like, the four or five visits and all of that. I Googled Georgetown. I looked at the campus. Uh, I was like, all right, cool. Like I called them. I'm like, I'm coming to Georgetown. Boom. And that was it. No, I didn't but, go through the whole recruiting process. Like go here. They try to sell you to come here. Right. I'm, like, no, I'm just going to come to y'all. Like I'm rocking with y'all. Now, before that, you talked about when you was younger, not really being that focused academically. Mm -hmm. And then that obviously had to change once you got to Georgetown. Talk about how you made that shift a little bit. And you talked about it a little bit in chapter 21, uh, once you got <laughs> to the first but I'm just, I'm just going through it. Yeah, Talk but- about uh, how that, that shift was. It was kind of scary because I almost flunked out of Georgetown my first semester. Yeah. And that's because I was scared to ask for help. I was scared, uh, like I didn't go to school. I barely made it through high school. Right. It's like, they gonna push you out. You had teachers who like, you know, enforce stuff, but for the most part, they like, you can make it. Like, you can do something. Like, we got to get you. I remember in 12th grade, I had to go back and take all these classes. And I had to get, like, straight A's to just get into Georgetown. So uh -huh. I had to go to school and stay back every day for, like, two months. 
So I was like, all right, cool, I'm gonna do that. And um, when I got to Georgia, I'm like, hold on, this is different. This is a predominantly white school. Uh, One, I, I was definitely not comfortable just being here when I went right. into the classroom. And um, like I said, I almost flunked out of Georgetown my first semester. So when I went, I just kept going to class. I wasn't doing nothing. And I couldn't balance everything, like working out, double workouts, getting some food. Like I couldn't balance that. But um, I eventually was like, man, I need help. I was like, I need help. I need help. And they put all the necessity, necessities in place for me to be successful. And that's how I was able to just get through Georgetown. Um, they made sure I was going to succeed. They wanted me to be successful, if that makes sense. You know, it's interesting because that's something that a lot of young people relate to right now as far as not wanting to admit that they need help with something. You know, kind of like a pride thing. You know, and you know, you're struggling with a class, but you don't want to tell nobody that you're struggling. <laughs> and so you just struggle even more. That's basically where you were the, your freshman year uh, at uh, chapter 23, um, you know, at Georgetown, right? Nah, they just was like, no, we're going to put this. So you need a tutor for this. Okay, here's the tutor. You need this. Okay, well, we're going to go get this person to help you. Well, you don't right. know how to write a paper on a Word document. Well, we're going to put you in this class so that you can learn. Well, you don't speak properly. They're going to do this. Like, they just made sure that I was going to be uh, successful. And that's what I love about Georgetown. And that's why I wear it on my chest. Like, you see, like, every time I step out, like, Georgetown Hoyas all day. I see it. And you would send records, three-point shooting specialist records all through Georgetown. So I know I've never read <laughs> I see what you did. You So your name is up there in the Raptors. Um, chapter 24 was very interesting. And that was about your father. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, talk to me about why you you chose to include uh, this chapter uh, right in between your your freshman and senior year. Um, I wanted to mention my dad because when y'all when y'all read the book, you some people are like, oh he was a bad guy, but he was a great guy. Um, it's just this one point in my life where he he dropped the ball because he had I was a child out of wedlock, so he had a whole nother family. Mm -hmm. So when it came that time to take me in, like you know. This is how I look at it. I'm like, okay, his wife doesn't want me there. Fine, like I get it, like, but you shouldn't hold that against the child. Cause I didn't, you know, they made me here. Like I didn't ask to be here. And um, you know, when all of that happened, I was just like, I gotta include my dad. But um, you know, I'm 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 a very forgiving person and I, it was just good that I mentioned that part because it just sat on my heart heavy. So I thought it was great that you mentioned that part. You said good. I thought it was great. And this is the reason why. Um, because a lot of young people are dealing with things that they keep inside and don't tell anybody. And you're putting it on front street that this is what, you, you know, you said you're a child out, out of wedlock. They had a whole different other family. And most people would not say that <laughs> publicly to anyone. You know what I mean? But them reading that about you, there's a lot of other people who are in a situation like that. Mm -hmm. or, where it's a little bit rocky with their father. So your book is so inspirational just from start to finish in so many different ways. And I'm, I'm really glad that you that you wrote it. And let me just pause for a second to ask you, what gave you that comfortability to be this open and be this honest about yourself um, in a book for the world to see? I think uh, when I went to Georgetown, I had a coach, his name was Coach Brown. And he suggested that I go to counseling. And I'm like, I ain't going to counseling. Like, these white people can't tell me about these problems. I can't relate. Like, mm -hmm. and I was just ignorant to the fact of going to counseling. So, and like I said, like counseling is taboo in the African American community. So, you know, you just get crazy, you could call crazy, you just but I became knowledgeable of going to counseling and I was able to better myself and take advantage of the opportunities around me. And um, I mean, I was just so traumatized from everything that was happening in my past. And it, it just helped me understand how traumatized I really was. And I was able to work through all of those situations. And um, even just up until the book it released, like I've been still going to counseling because I just needed to get that out. Like I, needed to stop compartmentalizing some of these things so that I could be a better person, so that I could understand who I was and what my purpose was. Mm, that's great.
That's great. Um, and talk about uh, preparing for the pros right after your senior years. Um, you're, you're, you're feeling, you didn't talk like, I mean, you've been through all of this stuff. Pressure of playing ball didn't really seem like it was that much, to be honest. It wasn't. It, wasn't. it, 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 it seemed <laughs> like it wasn't at all. I mean, you're, you have the pro scouts coming. You have the different people talking to you. You have, you know, you need to make this percentage. It didn't seem like that phased you at all after you've been through all of this. Is that? No. <laughs> I mean, it didn't. I'm going into the pros, it's just like, oh, man, like I got an opportunity to play in the pros. So when I went and my name was called uh, – I was like, oh, okay, like, this is going to set the way for me to do other things financially. Mm -hmm. uh, just being able to take care of myself, if I want to buy me a house, if I want to get a car, you know, whatever it is that I, I'll be able to take care of myself. Um, but just hearing my name called, I was just like, man, what a dream come true, because I went number 14, and mm -hmm. my mom passed away July 14. Mm -hmm. so I was like, oh, this was, this was all in the makings, if you ask me. Wow. And he had a fantastic, you know, rookie year. Y'all won a championship that year. Uh, that's, that's a pretty good way to start off. You know what I mean? Talk about that, right? <laughs> no, nah, I was on a great team. We had Maya Moore, Lindsey Wells, and Rebecca Brunson, who's a Hoya. I got them winning with her, the only other Hoya in the WNBA wow. um, at that time. But um, it, was a, it was a great experience. I was just mad because I didn't play a lot. But it was so many great players in front of me. I had to learn how to be a team player and I mm -hmm. couldn't walk around with this horrible attitude because I couldn't, like I wasn't playing. I just had to work harder. Mm -hmm. And now um, that's what I continue to do. I continue to cheer for my teammates. I learned how to cheer. Like I learned how to cheer from the bench and that was kind of weird to say, but I ended up working my way up as you can see over my career, but um, I learned how to win. And I learned what it takes to win a championship. You know, it's interesting because as I was reading about the um, your time in Minnesota, and you mentioned all the amazing players that you had on your team, but still you wanted to play. <laughs> and it was I, like... Hands down, I want to play. That's how it is. Yeah, I know these cats are good. All these people are all great, <laughs> but I want to play. But yeah. a lot of people don't understand, especially young players, how sometimes you have to be patient. You they have to be patient. About, I'll talk about how tough that was to be patient. I mean, and it is tough. Now, don't you know, as, as athletes, we want to play all the time. So all the time. No who every it is. minute. Yes, no, every no minute. minute. Right. But talk about how you had to learn how to be patient. I, I mean, I, I just had to learn how to be patient. I had to adapt to my new role. That was my new role. Like, you're going to play here and there, but these people are going to play majority of the minutes. And I could just recall, like, Simone, like, Simone Augustus, Monica, um, Monica Wright, they always like, just stay in the gym. Keep working on your game. Your time is going to come. And um, I'm like, okay, my time going to come. And they traded me to New York. I was like, and y'all going to trade me? Okay. So then that was more motivation. Right. Like, I went to New York. I got in the gym every day. And then I remember Teresa Weatherspoon came like my second year. And right. I went to a game and we came back to practice. And she was like, you don't look right. She was talking to me. I was like, man, I'm not playing. Like, what's up? Like, I, I'm not understanding. I'm like, I'm nice. Like, I'm good. <laughs> so I was like, do you mind, like, staying back? Like, coming back after practice? Staying back after practice and then coming back at night. And mm -hmm. then I'll get in here in the morning time early so we could continue to work on my game. Mm -hmm. And she was like, a lot of players don't ask for help. Right. So I asked for help. And I started to take off from there, like. My game just evolved, and I was just excited to see, like, all the hard work that I put in was finally paying off. And, um, you know, I went to New York. I had an amazing time there, and I remember I got into the starting lineup. I'm hyped. I'm so hyped. I'm in the starting lineup every night. They was like, during this season, it was like, well, we need you to go back and come off the bench. I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> How did we get to this point? Right. I'm a starter. I'm averaging like 18, 15, like just yeah, killing yeah. a stat sheet. I'm like, why y'all want me to come off the bench? Uh -huh. It was like, we need you to come off the bench because we ain't getting no production. I'm like, well, that ain't my problem. That's what I'm thinking <laughs> in my head. That's something you're going to have to fix that, but it ain't going to have to be me. Right. And it was like, well, we need you to come off the bench 
and I was mad. Like I was just struck. Like my whole, I was just numb because I'm like, why do I have to come off the bench? Right. So then I came off the bench, and at this point, this is what I'm thinking. Like I'm not even gonna play. I'm not even gonna play that well tonight. I'm just gonna be out here. That's what I'm thinking. I'm like, wow. I'm gonna just show y'all it ain't gonna work with me either. But I was like, nah, like I need to give my team what they need in order for us to be successful. So that's when I started coming off the bench and I had a great night that night coming off the bench. And they was like, well, that's kind of going to be your position. But then that year I ended up being a WNBA all-star. Yep. I participated in a three-point competition. I won six women of the year, which yeah, is kind of one of the hardest awards you can win. Right. And um, it was a great, you know, just adopting to my new role. Um, but uh, it was a great experience. <laughs> But it's there's so many lessons in everything that you went through. And this is why, you know, this book is really, I would recommend this for all young athletes. Mm -hmm. Every single young athlete should read this because you go through the stories of triumph. You go through the struggles on the court where a lot of athletes right now are kind of in the mindset, well, if it don't work, you know what I mean? They want to start pointing the fingers at somebody else. The coach don't like me. And that's why <laughs> I'm not playing. That's it. You know what I mean? And that's the only reason. And, and they can't think there's any other reason that maybe the coach just wants you to come off the bench to, like you said, help the bench where there's not a lot of productivity. Uh -huh. and, and even the part where you're like, you're not playing, and then you go and ask for help and do extra work to earn mm -hmm. yourself away. And that is not seen nowadays. Nowadays, people are like, okay, I'm not playing. I need to go someplace else. This ain't working. I need to go. I need to hit into the transfer portal. Into the transfer. That's a whole different issue, right? <laughs> That's a new thing. Did you yeah. see how many people are into the transfer There's so portal? many kids in there. And I'm just like, as a parent, I get it. If your kid is going through a situation that they can't overcome, it's like, all right, cool. But at the end of the day, like, you're staying here. Yeah. Like, you stay, like, Work through it. You'll you'll get through it because you ain't gonna keep quitting your job, quitting your job every time it gets tough. Right. And those are the lessons that you're teaching <laughs> like throughout this book is you have to work through something. Everything's not just gonna come easy. Yeah, and for sure. The role that you had to take, it didn't come easy. You know what I mean? You had to work your way. You had to come in, you had to come back in that night, come back early, do extra work at the practice, before practice, all that stuff, and to earn your way back in where you easily could have. When you said the first thoughts were in your head of of just kind of pouting, pouting. I don't want to play here. I'm not gonna play good, you know. But just just pouting, which is a lot of the thoughts of a lot of athletes, right? But you didn't take that road, and you not taking that road, you ended up being six man of the year, six woman of the year. Excuse me. Yeah. That that's that's huge. <laughs> that is huge. And they was explaining it to me in the moment. I couldn't see. I couldn't understand it, and I couldn't quite grasp it. But once, uh, cause I got a picture of some, like I was sitting on the bench and I was just, my whole demeanor was just off. Mm. And they put me on ESPN. They was like, Bro. <laughs> and my cousin Kita like sent me the picture. She was like, this is how you look on the bench. And I was like, all right, I got to fix that because right. that's now on my image and what I, you know. Yeah. So I was like, no, nah, I got to fix that. And then I was like, I'm just going to buy into this new role. And that's kind of how I had longevity in the league, just buying into my role. Because every time they didn't need me to be a star player or they didn't need me to do this or be a – they always needed me to be a shooter. Mm -hmm. They always needed me to play defense. Things that I can control, that's the things that I did. Control what you can control, so Swin say. Right. And you had to you, – you talked about learning how to be uh, a, a cheer for your team. Like, even when you're not it, – it's so interesting because that is – you would think it was an easy concept, but it's not. <laughs> if, it's you're, not if you're sitting there, you want to play. You want to play, right? And somebody play. else is playing, and you're not playing, and you still got to cheer for them like you're happy for them. <laughs> and you it's really like you, you're not happy because you're not playing. It's not that right. I'm not happy for you, because I'm right. still happy for you as a player. Like, yeah. you're doing a daggum thing. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like, we all you have that play. inside us. I want to play. You want to play. You know, it's it, it's great. And we're going to open this up soon for, for um, questions. And you can put your questions in the chat. And then I'll ask whatever questions pop up. And so I want to talk about this, this, this chapter 31, self-talk and positivity. And this is really where you ended um, the book and how you are not only 
speaking to yourself, but you're speaking to other people and how you're going to use this book and what you're, you're talking about the way that you see yourself as a role to be inspirational for, for younger athletes, especially younger women. Um, talk about that and that role that you've embraced now of being this role model and being this inspiration for a lot of younger people. I think the one thing I used to always say, like, I'm my biggest motivator. So I've always uh, carried that with me. Like, I have to motivate myself because if I can't motivate myself, no one else can or no one else stands a chance. So just that positive reinsurance in self and just loving self. Um, I just try to teach that when I'm around, you're like positive reinforcement. Um, just in my circle of life, like I, I feed off positive vibes. I try to not like entertain the negativity or negative, you know, situations. I'm just more so like a vibey person. So let's talk about a little bit more detail with the negativity because you talked about it in here and you said that sometimes you said misery loves company and sometimes miserable, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you was talking about the miserable people that like to come around other people when they, then they, when they're down a little bit and kind of attached to them and how you kind of block out that all, all together. And people just wanna, some people just are evil. Like they just want to come in <laughs> and just pull you down, pull you down. But right. I ain't trying to go down. I'm trying to go up. Right. I'm trying to go up. So I don't want to be around it. Like I cut it out. I don't care if it's family or whoever it is. I'm like, no, nah, like you can't be around. Like you bringing all that negativity over here. I don't right. need those uh, negative vibes around me. I need positive. So positive people go in positive direction. Negative people go in negative direction. That's how I've always. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So now, now you're with the aces. How do you, how do you, how do you like it? How, what's, what's uh, the, the well, difference? I'm not with no one in right now. I am a free agent. I am in grad school. So I'm focused on that, getting my master's. I went back. Oh, you went back to get the master's. I That's went right. back to get the master's at Georgetown. Georgetown, we are exactly. back in here. Georgetown. Right. But um, I went back and um, I started uh, the program two years ago. Okay. A year and a half ago during the playoffs. Uh, during the playoffs, uh, I started and um. I just took my last capstone course. So I hopefully I should be graduating uh, May the 21st, 23rd, May 23rd at one o'clock. Oh, wow. Okay. That's great. So are you, are you retired, retired, or are you just taking a break? I'm just taking a break. That's what I thought. <laughs> I'm just taking a break. I That's need a break. Thought. School, you know, planning a bubble last season that was stressful. So I'm just like, man, I need a break. I've been going, going, going. Now it's time for me to take a break let me ask you a little bit about that about the bubble um situation because a lot was going on in the bubble and there was a lot of ways that the WNBA in particular were using their platforms in a way that was just amazing to me mm -hmm. to be honest with you and it was a way that you know what, what, what I always tell people um when I'm talking to younger people and talking about activism and talking about things people to look and watch the WNBA. And this is the way that you get things done. Even going back before when, you know, they, it, it was like, it was back-to-back -back murders of Philando Castile and Alton Sterling. And the when they whole- they find us for the t-shirts. Yeah, right. They, they find us for the t-shirts, they find us for all of that. I was like, man, like this is, this but is what was, But what was crazy is they, they find, they said, okay, nobody, nobody do it again. If you do it again, you're gonna get suspended and fined, right? And then the whole league did it <laughs> together. And then they can't suspend everybody. You know what I mean? They can't find everybody. And then they backtrack on their position. They say, oh, we appreciate our players' activism. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, that's great. But if it was just a few people doing it here and there, they, they would have got find them. But right. the so it was, talk about the togetherness of just the women of the WNBA and how they're able to create that. Because I always... I always ask that because this wasn't done. The NFL didn't do this. When Kaepernick took me for a while, he was taking me by himself. Like, mm -hmm. you know, everybody was, you know, back in the day when Mahmoud Abdul-Aruf, he was by himself. Craig Hodges by himself. You know what I mean? But y'all all did it together. And I just thought that was so amazing. Talk about that aspect a little bit. I mean, just, I'm just grateful just to be a part of like the WNBA and then being in the bubble as far as the social justice movement and then fighting for change. Like, you know, just playing in the honor of Black Lives Matter movement and say her name campaign um, this past season, but seeing all 44 players unite in the bubble. All of us are in the bubble. Mm -hmm. We are in a room and we're chatting about, 
you know, what it is that we're going to do, how we're going to do it, what plans and schemes we're going to come with, um, come with um, to be united as, as one. And, um, you know, I just applaud the WNBA for allowing and the WNBPA with Who Stands By Us by, you know, just allowing us to just use our platforms to fight for change in this country. I think it was great. And let me ask you one more thing. How did y'all get the white players to all join you like that? I mean, because some of them, and, and be honest, they're from overseas. So they're not even from here. So they don't even know what's going on. You know what I mean? But they're all joining you together. How, but how they understand able- what we're going through and they're knowledgeable because we have like Zoom sessions that you can join and people are talking and, you know, just speaking about these situations and they can see they're not blind. Like they can see. They can see, and um, they just came in. They wanted to be a part. It's not like somebody forcing you to be a part of something. It's like, you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, then we respect you. Uh, we respect you. I think it's great because they did it. And they <laughs> stood with y'all. I think it was fantastic. All right, let's go to the Q&A. Um, okay. again, if you have some questions, just put them in the uh, Q&A, and I'll read them off. Uh, the first question is from Miss Jack. Jacqueline Miller, who asked, she said, proud to be here representing um Up to us Sports. Up to us Sports. Okay, yeah, I know Up to us Sports. <laughs> uh, she said, this question is for Sugar and for a time. All right. Coaches are such a powerful part of any athlete's experience. What is one thing a coach taught you that has stuck with you through your careers? And who is that coach? Um, I, I mean, I have several, but I think coaches always said, just be you. Don't try to be nobody else be who you gonna be and that 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 has stuck with me forever because I can't be the next person over there I can't do what this person I only can do the things that I can do so that's kind of everything that stuck with me that's great I'll answer mine real quick was um Reverend Potter was my AU coach growing up and he just told me you know simply don't ever let anybody outwork you very simple you know what I mean? He said, people can have more talent, everything like that, but don't let anybody ever outwork you. So that was really what stuck with me. All right. Um, Daniel Cross, Danielle Cross wrote, um, who are the first people that read your copy of the book? Who was the first people? Mm-hmm. Um, that read your copy of the book. So who, maybe who are the first people that you gave the book to? Well, Danielle Cross is my cousin. And oh, she, she, uh, okay. she was one of the ones, but my family, like my support system was the ones who I gave the first copies out to. I didn't even keep one for myself, but I gave it to my family. And, um, you know, my sister was the one who gave me the first like feedback. And she was like, I didn't know that's how you felt. Oh. Because me and my sister have become close now. We uh-huh. wasn't close always, but we uh, just became close. She was like, I didn't know, like, that's how you felt about the situation. Like, she got an understanding from that. And it kind of brought tears to my eyes that she kind of had to learn it through a book. But at the same time, it just shows me, like, that our relationship is kind of growing because we're able to talk about those things now. Okay. Well, um, a good follow-up question that Daniel asked was, what was the hardest part about writing this book? I mean, just really, like, just getting it on paper. (laughs) <laughs> and then going to canceling and doing that work and having to talk to somebody about these situations when I kept them a secret for so long. Mm. Yeah, you know, I I can't imagine how tough that was because you really opened up a lot. And like you said, you're you're opening up about things that you don't tell anybody else. Were some of the things kind of therapeutic for you to kind of write through and kind of write out? So when I went to counseling, that's what one of the things were, because I didn't like to talk. Like, I didn't talk to anybody. This right here is a lot of talking for me. And oh, okay. It's me being an introvert and just being to myself. But um, they suggested that I write it down. So then I was like, okay, cool. Like, I'll write it down because I'm not talking to y'all. Like, I'm just coming because my coach wanted me to come and at least try it one time. So I was <laughs> right. like, all right, cool. Like, I went in there. I'm, they asked me questions. I'm just not talking. He's like, well, you can write it down. Here's a like journal. Wow. I was like, all right, cool. Like, I'm gonna write it down. And then I would give it to him. And then he would read them and he would just be like, and then I got comfortable and I started to open up. And then we started to talk about these stories. That's good. All right, we got some more questions coming in. All right, Jason Wright said, What master's degree degree program um, are you completing? And what are your plans after your WNBA career? 
Um, the STEM program, which is the sports industry management program that they have, uh, kind of teach you like how to be an agent, do a budget, uh, you know, be a general manager, athletic director, if you want to coach on the collegiate level. But um, hopefully I get into coaching. Um, I, w- I want to get into coaching, if I should say. Okay. All right. Um, Patrick Waring said, uh, do you keep in contact uh, with the current team at Georgetown? Uh, what are your thoughts on the program, women and men? Um, I talked to Patrick. Me and Patrick treat me like his little sister. Anything I need, he just, you know, make sure he take care of me. Uh, so uh, Big John would say, he better uh, take care of you. Coach right. Thompson. And um, I, I'm in touch with the, the women's program as well. But Patrick is turning the program around. And hopefully I go back and turn the women's program around. Y'all know somebody? Put me on. <laughs> uh, to be a coach at Georgetown would be a uh, phenomenal, uh, you know, for me coming out. But uh, we should see. You know, right now I'm just taking a break. That's great. That's great. Uh, do you know um, Coach Lewis Orr from the men's team? He's one of the assistant coaches. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, so he was my coach at Syracuse. That's my guy. Like, that's my guy. Syracuse. Juice that orange, juice that orange. We used to give y'all the business. We ain't going to (laughs) talk about that. (laughs) We we used to, when I was there, we gave Georgetown the business. So, (laughs) you know what I mean? But now, Coach Orr, that's that's my guy. And much respect for, you know, Patrick Ewing, Big John, all of the, you know, the whole Georgetown history. Mm -hmm. Always much respect for Georgetown. All right, let's see. Daniel Cross, Danielle Cross said, if you get to coach, would you do college or WNBA? I'll do uh, I'll do collegiate, whether it's man or woman, and then I'll do the pros, whether it's man or woman. Okay, either one. Okay. Um, Ray Ann Weaver asked, "Have you given any thought to writing a book aimed for middle schoolers?" Oh, this book is for middle schoolers. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, <laughs> you can read this in middle school if you're in middle yeah. school. I mean, uh, for the first half of the book, she's actually in middle school. Throughout, you know, she's telling different things that are going on during her middle school time and i think this this is perfect for starting from middle school to be Mm -hmm. honest um it's 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 a great book it's a great read like i said i'm gonna have my daughter read it um so i i think it's really inspirational so to answer your question i think it's perfect uh for middle schoolers um what type of coach do you think you would be are you are you would you be like a yeller would you be like the person that brings the arm around you talk about it quietly would you be like what kind of coach would you be <laughs> i'm more of a player's coach you know i play so i understand like all the ins and out but um i'm more of a positive reinforcer so mm-hmm. when you mess up like don't look over here like you just messed up like keep playing i've always when people mess up they look at the coach and it's like right. No, like focus on the game. Like that's over. We'll get it back. Like let's get it back on defense. Right. Yeah, I know. I, I don't know about the hugging because I'm not like a affectionate person. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm definitely a player's coach. Player's coach. All right. All right. Uh, Danielle Cross. She got all the questions. All right. She got She's, all the questions. Will there be a sequel to the book uh, that shows readers your transition to the WNBA? Some can be in the works. I write stories. I still kind of do the therapeutic thing of just writing stories now. Um, so we shall see. Because I would really like to touch more on like in-depth far as college and going through that whole process. And then being in the WNBA and if I decide to retire whenever, up until that point. And then maybe book three will be about the next part of my life. But I ain't got there yet. <laughs> You know, you said you you don't like talking a lot, but you seem pretty comfortable talking with right now. I mean, we didn't flow through in an hour, and you you seem pretty good. Why why you say you don't like talking that much? I don't like I don't I just don't. It's just not in me. Now, if I have to, then I will. But um, right now I'm like very nervous, very nervous. I'm I'm sweaty. Like I have very bad anxiety. Oh really? But, um, I I get through. I get through what I need to get through, and then when I'm done, I'm just like. <sighs> Good job. You made it through. Well, you know, I think it's, it's, it's really commendable for you to do something that is difficult for you to do, but you know the benefit of it and mm-hmm. you know the people who are going to be inspired by it. And that's what's really, you know, it's so important. Your, your story, you know, like I said, from the beginning to the end, um, it's so inspirational because you had to overcome so much. Mm-hmm. And there were so many different times where you could have given up. You could have said, okay, you know, this is, this is too much. <clears throat> 
and I don't even want to be bothered with life anymore. So I'm no, not going to, you know, pursue anything. So you're mm-hmm. not going to pursue doing the right thing. You could have easily fallen and, and got into the same life that was around you. And same that's thing. one question I do want to ask. How did you not get into that life? It was My, all around you, your family, your, your neighborhood, everything like that. How did you not get into it? My sister was like, you're not going to go down the same road. Like, you're not going to do these things. Like, we have already made the mistakes. They have said, like, they. that's all my sister used to call on a collect call. She was like, no, like, you can be somebody. You can do it different. You don't have to go down this route. Look what this route has gotten me. Mm. That's kind of what my brother said, my sister, my nephews. And then... um. I was just like, man, I don't have to. Like, I have sports. I can go and do it this way. So let's just go down this new route. Nobody has taken it in the family. And let's see, you know, what comes out, what the outcome is going to be. And, you know, professional athlete, uh, graduated college. I'm the first to graduate college. I'm about to be the first to get my master's. So, you know, just paving the way for the people in my family who's coming behind me. Now they have, uh, you know, something to look forward to, something that's positive. And, and how, but how did you see that when you're in middle school? You know what I mean? Like, that's the thing. I, <laughs> I didn't. I just had people telling me, like, don't do this. And I'm like, all right, I'm not going to do that. Okay. I know it's wrong. Like, I had people say, like, you don't want to do that. Like, I already did it. So why am I going to do it? You already did something bad and it turned out bad for you. Why am I going to do the same thing? Mm. Mm. Okay, but some people don't see it like that. They're just like, no, like, I'm doing it. Like, I don't care what they say. Like, no, I actually care what my sister said, although she was in jail. I care what my brother said, although he was in jail. Like, I I care. Like, I wanted to be better. And they wanted me to be better. Right. Yeah. Right. Who else around you at that time poured into you um, positivity? Um, my, my cousin Keita. My cousin Keita. Um, like I said, like, I wouldn't be the woman I am today without my whole family. But my cousin Keita taught me how to be a woman. And she taught me, like, she showed me things. So she graduated college. Um, she went back at a time when I was staying at her house. And mm-hmm. she was like, well, you can go do this and you can do this. And she wake up and go to her nine to five. And she's married. Like she, that's just positivity for me. And I'm like, oh, these are the things I want to do. And that's kind of who I looked up to. And my niece as well, because she was a hard worker as well. That's great. That's great. Well, I can't say enough how much I respect you uh, for everything you've done. Everybody, the book is called They Better Call Me Sugar. And it is it is a great read. It is something that I definitely recommend. Like I said, I'm having my own daughter read this. I'm, right after this, I'm gonna hand her this book <laughs> so, so she can so she can read it. And I really want to thank you for putting this together. And like I said, for having the the courage to be able to be so open mm-hmm. and you no know, so guarding. You tell the whole story. And you tell story, you tell things that, you know, a lot of people, like I said before, would have kept to themselves and only told the good parts. Mm-hmm. You usually tell a good a, a story that is just like, yeah, and then I busted them up when I played them, <laughs> and then I busted them up when they, they were that. You could have easily done that, and it would have been a dope story. But you, but you didn't do that. You told the whole story of everything that you battled with and everything that you, you know, had to overcome and everything that you had to deal with and the temptations and the people that steered you the right way and the positivity and every, you know, the whole line, even so much to where you were, you know, the struggles that you had uh, on the court as far as having to deal with being patient for your time to come. And then it came, yeah. you know what I mean? So, and then you went back to go get your master's. I mean, it's, it's a really wonderful story. So that's all I can say is much respect to you and keep doing what you're doing. You know, we're, we're all the same, you know, publishing team now and, and it, it's great. And I love what you're Gosh, doing. Look. We were probably yeah. going to be doing some more events together. So. <laughs> no, thank but you. Thank you for taking out the time, you know, to host the event and thank you to politics and pros for, you know, having us um, and everybody else who came out to this amazing event. Definitely, definitely. Make sure you get out and public and purchase the book. But I also got like a little a little surprise. Okay. I got a little surprise. All right. I am the audio book. Ah. I am the audio book. For those who like audio books, it's gonna be my voice you hear. I tried out, I got the part, and uh so yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Now was that hard to do? Cause it was pretty tough. I don't know how to um what is the word I'm looking for? 
it was tough. I didn't know, like, I was going in, I'm like, all right, I got this. But it wasn't like that. It was like, you know, having to read out loud and something I've, I've struggled with uh, in the past. And I talk about that in the book. And right. then having to act through your voice. Right. I was like, oh, man, like, oh, y'all want me to be a whole actor. I should have took some acting classes before I signed <laughs> up to this. So, like, the first day I went, it was pretty smooth. But I wasn't doing it. And they can hear the nerves in my voice. Uh, they can hear me like trembling like they was like all right we'll just use this as a practice day so i was like like any other thing i went home i kept reading a book i kept like studying like i'm like all right cool when i get here i kind of like flicker over this word but then the next day i was like boom knock it out and then it turned out amazing so if you're an audiobook person i am the voice that's great that's great a lot of people love audiobooks they Listen to them while they're driving. Listen to them. So that's great. So definitely pick up the audio book or pick up the book right here. It is called They Better Call Me Sugar. All right. Thank you for listening to us. And we'll turn it back over to politics and prose. <laughs> I want to thank you both very much for this wonderful discussion. I want to thank everyone who has tuned in to listen, and hopefully, as Etan just said, you all can go purchase a copy or two from Politics and Prose directly and support our local bookstore. And of course, we just want everybody to stay safe and stay well read. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs>